Hi, Matt Morton, lead pastor of Cross Fellowship Church. Just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for watching this video today. It is my hope and my prayer that the message uh, really ministers to you and ultimately helps you take one step closer to Jesus. At the end of the message, you will hear an invitation to place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not already done so, I can promise you there's no better decision you could ever make in your life. If you have questions about just how to do that or you need to talk to someone about that, at the bottom of the screen here is a telephone number for the church office. Please feel free to call and we'll be happy uh, to spend some time with you. Uh, thank you again for watching today and in Jesus' name, blessings. Uh, yes, I'm the pastor at North Fork in Eufaula, Oklahoma. Uh, the lake is beautiful uh, sometimes. Sometimes it looks like uh, chocolate milk, you know. So uh, it depends on, depends on uh, uh, how much rain we've got and how much uh, sediment's flowing from the river into uh, the lake there. Uh, but it is a good place to pastor, and, 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 and we, do, we do love uh, being where the Lord has put us. Um, as Travis said, my, my wife Heather uh, and I, uh, we uh, have been married uh, 25 years, just celebrated our 25th uh, wedding anniversary. Uh, we met at OBU, Oklahoma Baptist University. I keep hearing people here say, hey, I went to OBU, or hey, my, my kid went to OBU. Or, hey. So I guess there's a pretty cool connection between this, this church and Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, my daughter uh, just finished her freshman year at OBU. Uh, and uh, my son, uh, Hunter, uh, is, is going into his junior year. So we're, we're very, very happy to be here. We love the mountains. Don't take what you have in your backyard for granted, okay? We have hills, right? In Poto, Oklahoma, it's like the, we're kind of known for the tallest hill in the world, okay? We're like a foot shy of a mountain, um, I'm not kidding. I really, it's just the truth. We're like a foot shy from a mountain. Uh, and, and we have things we call mountains there, but they're just like sad, like representations of what you guys have. So you guys don't ever take it for granted. We love coming to the mountains. Uh, Heather and I started, uh, when I was doing youth ministry, Heather and I started bringing youth groups up here to go skiing because that's what you did like in the 90s and, and into 2000s. You, you brought youth groups skiing to Colorado. Uh, you guys know on spring break, there was the invasion from Oklahoma and Texas you know, and then I'm sure you guys were glad when, when we all left. Um, but I can remember one ski trip in particular. I was the youth pastor at First Baptist Mesquite, Texas. And uh, uh, we decided we we're going to come up here, take the youth group skiing. A lot of them have never been skiing before. Uh, we decided we were going to go, and, uh, and, and we'd all load in this old people mover. Uh, and we thought, okay, well, you know, usually it takes about 13 hours uh, to get from the Metroplex to... to um, uh, you know, to, to, to Breckenridge, because that's where we were going. Uh, but that, that thing didn't do but maybe 60 miles an hour with a good tailwind. So we figured 15. Um, we made it like 17. Uh, and so we were, we, Heather and I kept telling everybody, because so many people hadn't, hadn't really been to the mountains, we kept telling them, like, you've got to drink water, you know? And you guys know why, right? You've got to drink water. Altitude sickness is a real thing. Drink water, drink water, drink water. Somewhere lost in translation, they heard, drink energy drinks, drink energy drinks, drink energy drinks. And so, to be quite honest with you, we had several kids get sick. Uh, only one puked on the, 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 the bus, which made the experience so pleasant. Um, then, then when we get up there, our, our driver, it starts snowing. And it doesn't snow in Texas. It just doesn't. Well, I mean, it does, and it shuts everything down. But, uh, and so, like, he's getting worried. We're on, you know, 25. We're north of, of Colorado Springs now. And he's like, we need to put the snow chains on. I'm like, I think they're going to do a good job of keeping the interstate clear. But, no, we gotta, I didn't want to argue. We put the snow chains on. Uh, on our way nor, uh, I mean, uh, uh, west of Denver on 70, one of the snow chains breaks. We hear this boom. Boom, boom, and it was just slamming against the fender of that, that people mover. Well, he was a large man. He can't get under the uh, people mover, so I got under the people mover, and I'm trying to pull this thing apart and, you know, unwrap everything. So needless to say, we're having a pleasant trip so far, right? Uh, I was so excited. I just got my brand-new uh, cell phone. Uh, granted, 2005, my first cell phone. Uh, never had a cell phone before. It was the Nokia Brick. Also used as a personal safety device. If someone attacked you, you could hit them with it. So I get this call on my Nokia brick, and it's, it's I don't know who the number is. I answer it. It is the condo company. And they say, now we have a problem. 
which is not what you really want to hear, like when you're almost there. And they said, uh, we have a problem. The group that was before you had too good of a time. There was alcohol involved. They harnessed their inner rock star and kind of did some damage to the condo. And, uh, and the owner is not thrilled with the youth group coming, so he said, you can't stay there. Cool. Where do we go? We haven't figured that out yet. Man, I started to panic. I really did. I started to panic. I didn't know what to do. And so I get off the phone with them. They're, they're working on it. I, I trust that they're working on it. I start praying, God, please provide. Because we, we got 35 people. Please provide. And as I'm, I'm looking out the window, we're up near Georgetown now, and I see the mountains. It's super clear. Snow's falling, landing in the beautiful evergreen trees you guys have here. Just looks so incredible. And, and, and I just, I'm praying and I'm looking at the glory of God's creation, the magnificence of God's creation. And in that moment, as I'm looking at God's creation and I'm thinking about God and I'm praying to God because I don't know what we're going to do, it was like all those questions, all that doubt, all that frustration just started to slowly fade to the background. As I'm focusing on God, God's creation, the magnificence of God, everything just started to fade to the background and all I could see was God. And I learned a really incredible principle in that moment that I've had to have, have, had, had to have God remind me of every time I keep continuing to go through like difficulty. Here's the principle. When you intentionally gaze upon God and his glory, everything else kind of fades to the back and takes its proper back seat. As you gaze upon God and his glory intentionally, everything else tends to take its proper back seat. Let's keep that in mind. If you have your Bibles, let's open up to Matthew chapter 22. I know you guys have been in Matthew for a while, so Matthew chapter 22. Travis uh, told me, you're preaching a really difficult passage. I said, cool. Cool. Very good. That's, 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 uh, uh, Travis was really glad I took this one. By the way, Travis, some, some lady, a uh, uh, really, really sweet lady, caught me after the first service. It was really cool. She said, for an Oki, you didn't do too half bad. <laughs> glad you set the bar so high here, Travis. So, all right. So Matthew chapter 22, let's read this together. This is Matthew chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 23. The same day the Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. They asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses says if a man is dying and uh, if a man dies having no children, uh, his brother must marry the widow and raise up uh, offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. Uh, the first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third, down to the seventh, after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God, he is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Father God, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray you will speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's through your Holy Spirit that you speak to us. And, and God, I pray that, that your word will come alive and we will hear it and, uh, and it will move in our hearts and our minds towards decision. And I pray, Lord, we will make decisions that will honor you, Jesus. Lord, we love you and we praise your name. In Christ's name, amen. A little bit of background on this passage. You guys know it. You guys have been studying it, but I need to, I need to go ahead and reference it. Uh, this was right after the triumphal entry. This is right after Jesus rode uh, the donkey's colt into Jerusalem, uh, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy and boldly proclaiming that he is the Messiah. I mean, he's, he's uh, like on a megaphone through his actions saying, I am the Messiah. People are worshiping him, laying down palm branches. Probably even more significant to this particular passage, right after that, he goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple. 
You see, and you probably studied this, you, you know, uh, the temple uh, uh, business was super corrupt. What was going on was the priests were making bank on the people. They were basically saying, listen, your sacrifice here is not good enough. You've got to buy a temple-approved sacrifice. And oh, by the way, you can't use you know, your regular currency. It's unclean. You have to exchange it for temple currency right, at a crazy exchange rate. And then you also have crazy prices for these temple sacrifices. So, so they were cheating people. They were cheating people in the midst of, of worshiping God, right? They're making a tremendous amount of money on these people, taking advantage in particular of the poor. They were really, really taking it. This was a money grab. It was dirty. It was wicked, right? And so Jesus goes in and he, he cleanses the temple. He, he overturns the, the, the money changers' tables. He drives out all the, the livestock out of there. Like, and this is happening in the court of the Gentiles, right? And Jesus says, like, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. A house of prayer for the nations, this is taking place in the court of the Gentiles where Gentile proselytes to the Jewish faith are trying to worship God, but it's impossible because of all the business that's going on, right? And so Jesus cleanses the temple. He kicks everything out. Remember, he kicks out, like, what the priests were doing. And this, this enrages the people. Uh, religious leaders are asking him, like, why, how, what authority do you have to do this? Why are you doing this, right? And in particular, this group of people, okay, the Sadducees, like, they come and they start asking questions, okay? They start asking questions. You see, the Pharisees, man, they've been asking questions already. They're trying to trap Jesus like, like, like uh, uh, you know, Travis talked about last week. And now you got this group called the Sadducees that are trying to, to trap Jesus. Who are the Sadducees? Well, there are five political groups in uh, uh, Jewish culture at that particular time. There's the Sadducees, there's the Pharisees, there's the Zealots with crazy hatred of Rome, right? Uh, ready for a revolution at any point. Uh, there was the, uh, uh, the Herodians that loved the Roman government and they, they compromised and, 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 and made a lot of money with, uh, hand in hand with the Roman government. And then the Essenes who pulled away from culture. Uh, John the Baptist was probably an Essene, right? Living out in the wilderness. So you've got these groups and, and this particular group is the Sadducees. The Sadducees are primarily priests. They're primarily priests and they're wealthy, right? They're super wealthy. They have a lot of power because they control the temple. Uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, was a Sadducee. Annas, the former high priest, Caiaphas' father-in-law, was a Sadducee. Like, these people have so much power, right? Now, a couple of things we need to know about them. This is how they differ from the Pharisees. We mainly encounter the Pharisees in the Gospels. Very rarely do we actually talk about the Sadducees in the Gospels. But, but they differ because the Sadducees, it says right here, did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection, Right? The old pastor joke is this, it's stupid, but you know, I've been listening to Travis's jokes all weekend, so this is appropriate. So uh, the pastor joke is this, it's, uh, you know, because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, they had no hope for beyond this life, which made them sad, you see. Okay, dumb, dumb, I know. But they didn't, they didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did, a lot of the other religious leaders did, but they didn't. They believed right here, right now. The other main difference between the Sadducees and uh, the Pharisees was that the Sadducees only believed that the first five books of the Old Testament, which we call the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? They believed that was the only authoritative word of God. They did not believe that any of the, the writings of the prophets, like, like uh, Daniel or Jeremiah or Isaiah, none of that was authoritative. They didn't believe in the, the rabbinic traditions of the, the Pharisees or anything like that. They only believed that the first five books, the Pentateuch, that is the actual authoritative word of God. And if you could prove it in the Pentateuch, they, they accepted it. They believed it because it was in those, those first five books, right? So that's kind of the differences between uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But then the Sadducees come up to Jesus with this question. It's an outlandish question. Like they're taking something to the most like illogical, hypothetical extreme. 
But it's based on what they called uh, uh, Leveret marriage law from Moses, okay? And the idea was this. The idea was that, uh, you know, if a man died in Jewish culture, right, then the brother of that man had to marry the wife if there was no offspring, right? If there was no offspring, uh, the, the, the brother of the man had to marry, you know, this woman and give her offspring. Why? Well, number one, they wanted to preserve the family name. Huge important thing in Jewish culture. The second, and if you read the Old Testament, you, you know all the, the, the crazy thing that happened as they were distributing the land among the 12 tribes and all that stuff. Uh, property became extremely important for a family, and so they wanted to keep the family property, the family inheritance within the family. And so that's why they did that. So, so they got this law, and they're saying, hey, Jesus, remember this law that Moses gave us? Yeah, I remember. Okay. And so uh, <clears throat> I got this, this, this question I want to give you. Okay, so this man, he marries a woman, right? He dies, no offspring. So it goes to the brother. He dies, no offspring. So it goes to the other, the, the next brother. And, and it goes all the way through these seven brothers, no offspring. Then finally, she dies too. And then he asks, like, hey, they ask, Jesus, who's, whose wife is she going to be in the, in the resurrection? Resurrection was to them. This was their joke, I think, Right? And so they said, hey, let's bring it to Jesus. And I love what Jesus does. Verse say, hey, man, what a great question. Boy, you really thought through that. Or, hey, what a clever argument. He, he just goes straight to the jugular. He's like, you're wrong. You're wrong. You do not understand the scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus tells them the truth. And you don't understand the power of God. Jesus goes straight to it. Now, listen, this would have been so deeply offensive to these people. The Sadducees, remember, they're some of the wealthiest people in Jewish culture. They control the temple. They're the priests. They, they have so much power. Like, to, to, to tell them they don't understand the scriptures would have been a slap in the face because they spent, like, so much of their time studying and memorizing the scripture. Many of them probably had the entire Pentateuch, like, memorized, right? And they're priests. Their job is to stand like in the presence of God on behalf of the people. If anybody knew God, it should, be, it should be them. And Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. This would have been so deeply offensive to these people, right? Jesus cuts right to it. Now, I want you to see here that the Sadducees' issue was not this issue of marriage. The Sadducees' Their issue was not really about marriage and the resurrection. They didn't even believe in the resurrection, okay? There's always a question behind the question, folks. And the question of their heart was really about whether or not God's powerful enough to pull off the resurrection. That was the question. Is there really a resurrection from the dead? That was the issue, right? Because they couldn't fathom anything that could overcome death. Death was final. It was the ugly exclamation point on life, right? There was nothing beyond death for them. They could not even begin to imagine to wrap their minds around a God that was bigger than death. And so what Jesus is doing when he says, you don't understand the scriptures nor the power of God, he's looking at them in the eye and he's saying, you have a way too small view of God. Your view of God is too small. And folks, I think Jesus, through his word, is probably telling us the same thing. Because far too often, we have a way too small view of God. We'll come back to that in a second. So what Jesus does is he goes to the Pentateuch, to what they valued. He goes to Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, and he starts telling them about the story. Hey, you remember Moses, right? When Moses went to the burning bush, and God spoke to him from the burning bush. Remember what God said. God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, how does that answer the question of whether or not there's a resurrection, whether or not God's powerful enough for that? How does that answer the question, right? 
Well, here, here's, here's the thing, right? So when God tells Moses, I am the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob, like, he doesn't do it in past tense. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was their God, which would be totally appropriate if they were dead. Now, at this particular point, when God's speaking to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're all dead. They were dead long before Moses was born. God doesn't say, I was their God, which would be inappropriate because they're dead. No, God says, I am their God. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. You know why he says that? Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob weren't dead. They were with God. They're spiritually alive because they are with God. So he's answering this question. He's saying that death is not the end. They are still alive because they are with God. He was not, he, it's not just he was their God, he is their God because, because God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead, Jesus says. So, so here's what you need to see. Like, he is taking the scriptures, the scriptures they valued, and he is using it to expand their view of God. He's using it to enlarge their view of God. He's showing them from the scriptures, God is way bigger than you could ever dare to dream or imagine. And folks, let me just say this to you right now. Jesus needs to do the very same thing for us today. He needs to use the scripture to expand our view of God, to show us God is bigger than we could ever dream or imagine. Because too many times, you and I, we have a way too small view of God. Let me show you how I know this. Because when you read this passage, your issue is really not with the resurrection. Your issue is what Jesus said about marriage. Your, your issue is not a, about whether or not Jesus raises the dead because the very fact that you believe in Jesus uh, for eternal life shows that you believe that there's a resurrection. No, the thing that bothers you and me is when we look at this and, and we see in verse 30 that Jesus says in the resurrection they will ne neither be married nor be given in marriage. And that bothers you. Because in our culture, we, we hold romantic love think every single Hallmark movie ever made, to this, this level, like it's the pinnacle of human existence. And if we miss out on human love, then we've missed out on life, right? That's what we hold to. And, and when Jesus says there's no marriage in heaven, which, by the way, I'm not going to try to explain because I don't get it. Here's what it does, though. It bothers you. It bothers you, and you think, man, what, like, like, if I can't be married to my wife in heaven, or some of you ladies are like, hey, if I can't be married to my husband in heaven, and then here's where it really gets ugly, the next couple of thoughts make you feel really guilty, because you're kind of like, man, I still want to go to heaven, because I don't want to go to hell, but am I going to be happy in heaven if I don't have my spouse? Am I going to be happy, right? And, and here's what this does. It shows how flawed our view of God is. Because when we start thinking of God, when we start thinking of heaven, and we start thinking about the things that we need in heaven in order to be happy, it shows that we're making it more about us than we're making it about God. It shows that, that, that we're not making it about him. Heaven is about God and his glory, and he knows your deepest needs better than you do. He knows what you need better than you do. He knows your deepest longings. Let me just tell you this. I'm going to straight up tell you, you will find what you need the most in God and God alone. Not just God's blessings, because marriage is a beautiful blessing from God, but we find what we need most in God and who he is. Oh, we have such a small view of God sometimes, folks. And what we need is we need Jesus to take the scriptures and expand our view of God. Let me do that real quick. Let me, let me show you here from scripture something that I, it just kind of blows my mind to think about. We'll start wrapping it up with this. This is Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. It'll be here on the screen. It says here, it says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, 
four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature uh, with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So you, you got this beautiful glimpse into heaven right here, into the throne room of God. But what intrigues me is, is these, these four living creatures, or as Isaiah 6 calls them, the seraphim. They're angels, right? Because if you read Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3, it's almost the exact same vision that Isaiah has that John has, right? And, and, and what we see is, is we see that these angels covered in eyes are, are flying around God, seeing God, and they're worshiping him. They're worshiping him, and they're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. And that's their worship song that they are singing, and the Bible says they never cease, right? They never cease. In fact, just to kind of put it in perspective, like Isaiah 6, okay? When God gave that vision to Isaiah, that was 800 plus years before Jesus gave this vision to John the Revelator, okay? So for at least 800 years, these angels have been flying around God, singing his praises. Holy, holy, holy is God. They're singing the same exact worship song. Let me just kind of throw this out there to you, okay? Do you think you might get bored doing the same thing over and over and over again for 800 plus years, maybe all eternity? Do the angels get bored singing praise to God, worshiping him? Do they ever think, man, can I just take a little day off? Go get a pizza, catch a movie. You know, can, can I just do something? Go camping? Probably not with Travis. <laughs> can I just do something, you know, rather than just this? And when we start to think that, when, we start, when I start to think that, it shows that I have a very small view of God because if we truly understood God, I'm telling you there is no possible way that these angels will ever get bored because the glory of God is inexhaustible. They have been flying and will continue to fly around God for all eternity. And every moment of every day, they're going to come around this new corner of God and they're going to see something glorious that they've never seen before. Something so glorious that worship is going to flow out of them involuntarily singing, holy, holy, holy is God. And they'll continue to do it. They'll continue to fly around and they'll see something new. They'll see something new. They'll see something new. And they will continue to see these new glories of God because God's glory is inexhaustible and it will be amazing for all eternity. They will never ever get bored and you and I won't in heaven either because God and his glory is so much bigger than we could ever dare to dream or imagine. God is so much bigger and then when we start to really get to know him from the word, when we start to really treasure him from the word, when we start to, when we start to know him and, and, and spend time with him and our view of God expands and grows, when we're, when we're with our, our church family, when we're in our small groups and we're talking about the glories of God and our, our minds expand to God and his glory and, and, his, and, and we start to see him bigger and bigger and bigger all the time, here's what happens, here's what happens. All these concerns, all these concerns, all these questions that we don't understand, they, 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 they kind of start to slowly fade to the background. Do we get the answers? Probably not here in this life. Do we understand, you know, God, why is there no marriage? And it, well, that probably is just going to fade to the background. It won't get answered, not in this life, but it won't be as big a deal. You know Why? Because you see, God in his glory, in his, in his glory and his majesty is enough. All of these things that we're so concerned about, they start to fade to the background. And as we intentionally gaze upon God and his glory, everything else starts to properly fall into place in the back seat. Because God becomes enough. Folks, this is what I want to call you to from Scripture today. Listen, I, uh, 
I just want to encourage you. This is the invitation today. I just want to encourage you. Today, as you're contemplating these things, my encouragement to you, my challenge to you is continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord. Spend time with him in the word. Christian, sometimes we get so busy, but spend time with him in the word. Intentionally gaze upon his glory in scripture. Intentionally gaze upon his glory in creation. Intentionally gaze upon his glory in community with one another. And, and, and some of you, like, you, you, need to, you need to figure out new things to do. For some of you, you need to get into the word consistently. For some of you, you need to join a Sunday school class or a life group, whatever you call it here. For, for some of you, you need to, to go to, to, to Travis, Pastor Travis, or, or one of the other pastors and say, hey, I don't really know what I'm reading in the Word, so can you please disciple me, or can you please find someone to disciple me? You need to intentionally grow and let Jesus expand your view of who God is so all of these other things that dominate your thoughts will start to slowly fade to the background. Christian, that's my invitation to you today. Maybe you need to come up here during the worship song at the end and just pray. Just pray about these things. But you know what? There also might be people in this room that don't know Jesus. And I'm just going to be honest with you. If you don't know Jesus, you can't experience the glory of God. If you don't know Jesus, you can't experience the treasure that God is because he is your only way to God. But you can give your life to Jesus today. You can be saved and again, I did the first service and I'm still not really sure how the invitation totally works. But I will be somewhere, I'll be right over here. We've got all these young people here. I'll be right over here. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you can come talk to me or one of the other people that come up. And you can, you can talk about how you can give your life to Jesus today and they will show you from Scripture. I will show you from Scripture. But the main point is this. You move as the Holy Spirit leads you. Let's pray and we'll go into our time of invitation. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you that you use your word to expand our view of who you are, of who God is. God, I pray you do that today. I pray you have done that today. Father, if there's people here that are Christians that really need to grow spiritually so that you can expand their view of God from the scriptures, then I, I pray they'll pray about that. And ask what you would have them do to grow. Maybe they just need to come down and pray about that, Lord. Or maybe, Lord, maybe, maybe they need to just take whatever step they already know they need to do. God, you lead them. And God, if there's anyone here that needs to give their life to you today, may they be bold enough to do that. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.